Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Welcome. Well, you know, as I prepare messages and I, I uh, put things together every week, it seems like almost every week, whatever I'm preaching about, God kind of tests me in that. Uh, it's like, do you really believe this? Are you really, really doing it? Like a couple of weeks ago, you know, I spoke about forgiveness. Remember, I had you write down somebody on a piece of paper that you were going to forgive, and we tore it up, and we made a mess in here. Remember that? And... Uh, you know, God really spoke to me through that. that. Hey, dude, there's somebody you need to forgive, you know. And, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm speaking about spiritual warfare, man, Satan attacks me like you wouldn't believe. And so the other day, Goldie said, why don't you talk about something nice? <laughs> talk about something easy. Talk about something positive. Pick a good topic. So today I'm talking about success, all right? So... <laughs> should be an easy one, should be, so we'll see how this goes. You know, if someone were to ask you, what are the secrets to success, to successful life, what would you tell them? Well, I was curious, so I did a little Google search on the Internet and said, you know, put in uh, the sec- just that, secrets to having a successful life and our success principles. You know, there are thousands <laughs> Thousands of different websites that came up with all kinds of different ideas. Um, You can get Jack Canfield's 64 Principles for Success. You can get the 7 Success Principles of Steve Jobs. There's Anthony Robbins' 5 Success Principles. There's there's literally thousands of different ones out there. There's all kinds of books that you can read on success. And and I've probably read most of them. I, I guarantee I've read more than most of you here have here. But uh, do, they really, do they really bring you success? There's this one specifically that caught my eye that uh, this website promised that anyone who consistently applies these principles to any area of their life will experience success in that area. It's a, it's a guarantee. You put these principles to practice, you will be successful. And they're all good things. Let me just list them off for you. Ten different principles. First one is vision. You have to have a clear picture of where you want to go. Exactly what you want to achieve and become. You got to keep that picture in front of you all the time. At the very top of your mind at all times. Number two is belief. You got to believe without a shadow of a doubt that you can do it. Believe that you will, be, will uh, receive. You will succeed. Believe in a higher power. Who is helping you get what you want? You know, I hate that when people say, oh, I believe in a higher power. Well, which higher power do you believe in? You know, is it yourself or is it Satan or is it, you know, the sun god, the moon god? What higher power do you believe in? This just says believe in a higher power. Third one is responsibility. Realize that you alone are responsible for your future. You alone are responsible for the outcome of your efforts. Don't look for anyone to blame Feel free to ask for help if you need it, but remember the final decision is up to you. It's your life after all. Number four is affirm. Make a habit of saying out loud what you hope to achieve. Speak of it in the present tense. I am fit and trim as opposed to I will be fit and trim. If you feel awkward speaking out loud to yourself, write it down and read it every day. Or better yet, write it several times a day. Number five is commitment. Make a firm commitment to action. Decide to take whatever steps you need to take to help you achieve your goals. Commitment. Then you have to honor that commitment that you've made and, and follow through with that commitment. Number six, set a smart goal. Now that you know what you want to achieve, make a, make a goal that you can achieve and, and take those tiny steps, those measurable goals to attain your success. Number seven is plan and take action. Work out a plan of action. Break down the plan into baby steps. Take a a step or two each day, reminding yourself that each step is bringing you closer to your goal. Perform each act to the very best of your ability. Give it 100%. Number eight is persistence. Don't give up until you've achieved what you desire. 
Be willing to change any part of your plan which turns out not to work. Yeah, but be persistent. Be persistent. Like Thomas Edison, he didn't give up in his quest to invent the light bulb, even though he'd failed 10,000 times. He, he said, we didn't fail 10,000 times. We just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. Be persistent. And finally, he, he invented the light bulb. And then gratitude, number nine. Maintain an attitude of gratitude, knowing that your dream is about to become a reality. Refuse to grumble when circumstances look contrary to that. Refuse to complain. Be great, grateful of where you are now. Have an attitude of gratitude. And number 10, become a giver in your relationships. Always think in terms of what can I do for the other person. Become a giver. What goes around comes around. After all, whatever dreams you have most likely involve some other people. So be a giver. So that's the 10 things that are guaranteed to give you success. Now, they're all good things. But will they lead to a successful life? Now, if I were doing a motivational seminar, I would give you those ten things, and you could apply them, and you could have success. Maybe success beyond your wildest dreams. But when you arrived, you will discover something. You will discover there's still something missing. Still something missing. When you've reached the pinnacle of success, you'll do like so many other have, others have. You will flame out. You'll have reached your goals, and you'll be there saying, Is this it? Is this all there is? What's missing? That's why we see so many very successful people in Hollywood, in business, who all of a sudden turn to drugs or commit suicide. They've reached the pinnacle. They've got fame and fortune. And all these things. But there's still something missing. What I'm going to share with you this morning goes much deeper. Much deeper than any motivational seminar, any ten steps to success. So open your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 28. There was this guy in the Bible. God called him a man after his own heart. He had risen from a poor shepherd boy to the king of Israel. We've been reading about him quite a bit in our daily reading as we read through the Bible this year. It was King David. Now King David was coming to the end of his life. He knew the time was coming when he was going to have to move on and someone else would take the kingship of Israel. His son. He was passing the baton on to his son Solomon. So he said some things to his son Solomon. This came up in our small group the other night, and I said, man, that'll make a sermon. Thank you. Um, he, he was passing the baton on to his son. And so before he died, he had some things to say. Have you ever known someone, and, and they passed away, and you remember the last thing they said to you? That sticks in your mind like nothing before. Maybe even a, a parent or a grandparent or someone who was close to you, and you remember those last words like it was yesterday. Well, that's what was going on here. Before David left, he had something to say. He first got the children of Israel together, and he told them some things, and then he turned to his son Solomon. And he had some very specific things to say to his son Solomon. So this morning, I want to look at six principles for success that we can learn from David and from his son Solomon. So, First Chronicles 28, verses 8 through 10. I want to just read this this morning. This is David talking to his son Solomon. He said, So now I charge you, in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father, and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house as a sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Okay, so what is going on here is more than just 
even passing the kingdom on to Solomon. He's also come up with this plan to build this temple, this place for God to dwell, where they could bring the Ark of the Covenant into this temple, that the Ark of the Covenant that they'd carried for many, many years out in the, in the wilderness. They were going to build this temple, but God said, David, you're not to build it. Your son Solomon is to build it. So it was very important that David would pass on some principles to his son Solomon that would serve him in not only ruling the kingdom, but in building this magnificent temple that God had commanded them to build. David had accumulated huge amounts of gold and silver and cedar that was to be used to build this temple. But God said, no, 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 you're not to build it. Your son Solomon is to build it. So here are the six things that David told Solomon. The first one is, get to know God personally. It says in verse 9, acknowledge the God of your father. You see, David's God was a personal God. He would never refer to him as the higher power or the man upstairs. He was a personal God to David. All we have to do is look at some of the verses in Psalms and see how personal that God was to David. When he was in distress, he was not afraid to come to God and to cry out to God as we see in Psalm 64. He says, hear me, O God. As I voice my complaint, protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever come to God and voiced a complaint to God? You know, God knows what's going on in your life. Don't be afraid to tell him. David sure wasn't. Psalm 69 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. He felt like he was, he was drowning with all the troubles he was having in his life. What kind of conversations do you have with God? To David, he was like, he was his friend. He was someone he talked to on a regular basis, no matter what was going on in his life. He was, he was able to talk to God. <clears throat> you know, if you're upset, vent to God. Not on Facebook. Okay? <laughs> vent to God. Tell God what's going on in your life. Sometimes when you put stuff on Facebook, it only makes you look like a fool. Vent it to God. He'll listen. He'll listen. Do you have that kind of a relationship with God? When David was guilty, he begged God for mercy. Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. That was after he had been caught committing adultery. He didn't try to say, well, it wasn't my fault. You know, if she wouldn't have been on her roof like that, it's her fault. He took responsibility and he came to God and said, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. That's when you know you have a relationship with God. When you can come to God and say, God, forgive me. God, have mercy on me. You know, how many times do you try to hide your sin? Pretend that God doesn't know. <laughs> Believe me, He knows. He knows. He just wants you to come clean. When He was happy, He would shout to the Lord with praise. We see many of those in, in the book of Psalms, but just one of them in Psalm 89. I will sing the Lord's great love forever. And with my mouth I will make your faithfulness known to all through all generations. <clears throat> So no matter what he was going through in his life, he had a personal relationship with God. He could talk to God no matter what. You know, the Bible tells us to pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Do you do that throughout your day? Or is, or is prayer to you this certain time when you sit down at a meal and you talk to God then and you thank Him for your food? Or maybe it's a certain minute or two of a morning or evening or whenever when you pray? Or is it like David was throughout your day? No matter what is going on in your life, develop that personal relationship with you. You could say, God, I praise you for this that's happening. Or, God, I need, I need a revelation right now. God, I need, I need wisdom in making this decision right now. That's a personal relationship with God. So that's the first one. 
The second one is, <clears throat> learn God's commands and discover what he wants you to do. He said in verse 8, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God. You know, David didn't give him a list of things to do as king. He didn't say, you know, when this happens, do this. When that happens, do that. He didn't give him a list. He just said, discover, discover God's commands. Discover what he wants you to do. Just learn God's commands. Now, how could Solomon do that? Well, by doing, number one, first of all, by developing that personal relationship with God, and also by studying his word. At that point in time, they would have had the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, at least. And uh, he could have studied those and, and learned about God. God had told Joshua, back in Joshua 1.8, he said, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Okay? Discover God's laws. You know, I hear people say, Well, I'm looking for God's will in my life. Well, my question is, where are you looking? Where are you looking? Or they'll say, well, I think God is telling me to do this or that. Really? Does it line up with what the Bible says? God will never tell you to do something that is contrary with his word. Never, never. You have to understand thing, something. You have three voices in your head. I've, I've done a message a few times called the three kings. You've got three potential kings in your life. Three voices in your head. The first one is you, your own flesh, your own self. And then there's Satan and there's God. Three potential voices. Which one are you listening to? Which one are you listening to? It's your job to discern which one you're listening to. The Bible says in Romans 8, 6, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Governed. <clears throat> what does governed mean? Being controlled by, right? So if you're just being controlled by yourself, <laughs> it says it leads to death. It says you've got a problem. You've got a huge problem. But governed by the spirit, governed by God's spirit, that leads to life and peace. So which one is governing your life? Which one are you following? So get to know God personally and learn what God wants you to do. Third thing is worship God with wholehearted devotion. He says in verse 9, and serve him with wholehearted devotion. Worship God with wholehearted devotion. You know, as human beings, we tend to be devoted to what we worship. Or should I say, we worship what we are devoted to. We worship what we are devoted to. What does it mean to have wholehearted devo devotion? Well, let's dissect those words a little bit. Wholehearted. Let's look at that word. First of all, just cut it in two. Whole. Whole. Whole means all, right? All of it. The whole thing. There's no part that is devoted to any other. Whole. All. And then heart. What's heart? When the Bible talks about heart, it, it's talking about the core of your being, your passion, your emotions. It's not talking about that, that little organ inside that pumps blood around your body. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about your, your passion, your emotions. So when David says to Solomon in front of all the Israelites, serve him with wholehearted devotion, what is he saying? He said, don't ever do what I did. He's saying, don't ever, don't ever let even a tiny piece of your heart fall like mine did. Like mine fell with pride when I numbered the, um, the armies of Israel. Like my, like my heart felt with, with lust, lust when I saw Bathsheba. Don't let even a small part of it do that. He says, wholehearted devotion, serving God. We find this consistent throughout the Bible. Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's wholehearted devotion. I don't know about you, but I need to work on that. So I guess God's still working on me this morning. <clears throat> all of it. 
How you doing with that this morning? Well, after you've worshipped God wholeheartedly, then you can do the th- number four. Serve God with a willing mind. Serve God with a willing mind. Verse 9 says, and with a willing mind. What's your mind? Well, it's a sum total of all conscious and unconscious processes originating in the brain. That's according to Webster. That's your mind. The sum total of all conscious and unconscious processes originating in the brain. Every decision you ever make originates in your mind. Your mind decided whether or not you'd get up and come to church this morning. Did you decide to do that willingly or grudgingly? He says, with a willing mind, being glad to do it. You know, your mind can be programmed to react in a certain way. We all have these filters in our brain so that when our brain gets input from our five senses, you know, you learn this in grade school, your five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, tasting, you get input through one of those five senses and your brain suddenly makes a decision. And it, it decides to react in a certain way. And it can be programmed to act in a good way or act in a bad way. I remember years ago I used to play softball. Used to play slow pitch softball. And uh, I was the pitcher. And I had this technique to, uh, to pitch that ball. You pitch the high arc. And if you put just the right spin on that ball, the ball would float just a little bit. And the guy that was swinging the bat would go right underneath it. And the ball, he'd either totally miss it or the ball would pop up. So I had this thing on my wrist where I would flip that ball, you know. And I got pretty good at it. We had some no-hitters that we pitched. Man, I was pretty good at it. But you know what? One day I, I went to throw the ball to first base. And I still put that flip in there. And that ball dropped right there. I couldn't throw the ball overhanded to save my life. My brain was programmed to put that flip in there. It was embarrassing. <laughs> but we program our brains through different things. So how do you program your brain in good things, in a good way? You have to control what goes into your brain. Again, Romans 8, 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Like a governor on a car or an engine controls the speed of that engine, controls what that engine does. We are to be governed by the Spirit. So how do you get your mind from being controlled by the flesh to being controlled by the Spirit? Romans 12, 2, Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By reprogramming your mind, you control the input. It's just like a computer. Garbage in, garbage out. Good stuff in, good stuff out. Control what goes into your mind. Okay, number five. He says, be faithful. He says, if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Psalm 97.10 says, let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. And who doesn't want to hear these words someday? In Matthew 25.23, where it says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Be faithful. He saying, hang in there, which brings us to the next one. Don't become discouraged. He says, be strong and do the work. 1 Kings 2, 2 says, and this was another instance where David was, was talking about dying and passing it on to his sons and he says, I'm about to go the way of the, all the earth. He said, be strong and act like a man. He's telling his sons, man up, boys. Man up. Act like a man. You know, the Christian life is not always an easy life, is it? Sometimes you just have to man up. We have challenges and problems just like everyone else. God gives us the tools to deal with those challenges and problems is a difference. He gives us the tools to get through it. You know, we see this happening all the time. People 
people come to church, they get saved, they get baptized, they, and as time goes on, they fail in one of these principles, or maybe more. They get lazy. They're not getting to know God personally. They're not learning His commands. They're not faithfully worshiping Him, and the result is very predictable. They soon start missing a Sunday here and there. Pretty soon they're falling back into the same sin, the same lifestyle, the same habits they had before. And then we never see them again. Why? Because somewhere along the line, one of these principles wasn't kept up. There was a breakdown of one or more of these. Now, I told you at the beginning that usually God slaps me around a little bit when I... When I preach a message and I thought, this one will be easy. I, he won't do, surely he won't do that with this one, but he did. <laughs> He's done it again. You know, so many times in my life, I've, uh, I've had people come to me for help. And uh, it, both inside and outside the church, so I've helped them. You know, maybe it was paying a bill for them or spending some time in counseling or whatever it may be. And for a pastor, sometimes when you see those people turn their back on the church and turn their back on God, turn their back on me personally, sometimes it's kind of discouraging. Sometimes it's kind of discouraging. Sometimes, and recently I was to the point where I was like, you know, I'm just not going to do it anymore. Somebody comes to me for help, you're on your own, dude. Sorry, just not going to do it anymore. But then I read this verse. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And God told me, you're looking the wrong place for your harvest, buddy. Looking at the wrong place for your harvest. In the proper time. That's God's time. God determines when that is. You know, I think it should be now, but God's timing isn't like our timing. They're two completely different things. So this morning I want to tell you, if you follow those six principles, those six principles for success, then and only then will you have the foundation for a successful life. Then all those other things that that I talked about at the beginning, well, you can do those things too. But if you don't have these six principles, let me tell you, they're empty. Those things are empty without these six principles first. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to apply these principles to our lives. Your word inspires us. It convicts us. It guides us on the path we need to go. And we thank you for that. Help us to apply what we've learned here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.